there is a certain moment where you have to switch to the neurosurgery. But even if you treat the patients, you go back to neurology later. I think it's very important that you have a marriage between the neurologist and the neurosurgeon. Here's a nice picture. It shows these two scientists who had a good idea to make a stereotactic frame on the right side. You see a, a, a stereotactic frame made of plaster that they fixated to the patient's head and they were able to uh, do lesions uh, deeply in the brain. Here you have a nice picture that was already uh, drawn in 59. So at the very early time of uh, the functional neurosurgery, the stereotactic functional neurosurgery. And this shows you the thalamus. On the left side, you see the part that we are displaying. So this part, this is an MRI picture. You have this part displayed on the right side. And you see that there is a somatotopy in the thalamus and a functiotopy. So more lateral, it is for the lower limbs, for medial, uh, it's for the uh, upper limbs and for the face, and more anterior, it's for motor functions, and more posterior, it's for sensory uh, functions. So in this thalamus, you are able to intervene and to make a lesions, for instance, because this is what they did at that time when they uh, draw this uh, map. Hustler was a neuropathologist uh, in Frankfurt, and he was able to draw these pictures based on animal uh, on animal experiments, but also uh, based on what he learned during the surgeries. And what we are doing there, I think it's always very complicated to understand what we are really doing. And I think I have a very simple model to explain that. Uh, for instance, for the tremor, the tremor, when we go for tremor, we go to this part, which is the VIM, the ventral intermediate thalamic nucleus. And this is an interface between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And there must be a good equilibrium between the cerebrum and the cerebellum in order to make your movements smooth. Imagine a child who tries to catch something, will do that. He will try to catch it, but he will not be able to do it in a correct way. And with the training go on, going on, going on, the child will always be more focused to catch that. And this is possible because you have a well interaction between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So you come with your finger, you go to my camera, and you say, OK, I want to touch the camera, but I go wrong. So my cerebellum tells me, no, 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 this is wrong. Go more to the, the, the mid. No, no, you are too, too right now. And so this is how we are steered. And this is how this works between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. And at a certain moment, you are trained that you will hit the point that you're reaching out. And if this interaction between the cerebellum and the cerebrum is too, how to say, too nervous, call it too nervous, you start doing that again. And this is what you have to treat. If this is a slight tremor, it's not a problem. But if this is this, you have to treat it. And what are you doing? You go to this specific thalamic nucleus, the VIM, what I mentioned here, and you make a small lesion. So you, 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 how to say, you suppress the interaction between the cerebellum and the cerebrum, and you reach out this way. This is what we do, nothing else. And what we, we need is to have a point that is reliable, that we can find, that does not make side effects, and then we can really intervene in this way. Tremor is very easy to explain. All the other symptoms like rigidity or like uh, akinesia or dystonia is more complex. But I think the uh, tremor is a good example, a very basic example, to understand what we are doing and what is the maximum that we can expect. So we are not changing the brain. We are simply reducing these paths and we make a normal movement possible again. And therefore, after we need for these patients uh, physiotherapy, we need also ergotherapy and all these things are necessary in order to make smooth movements again without disturbing movements like could be tremor. This is what we are doing. 
And here you see a classical ablation. This was from a picture from uh, Lars Lexell, where he did a, a lesion with the gamma knife. You can do it with the gamma knife, with focused X-rays. You can do it with, uh, with cold, like cryo. You can inject alcohol. But in the majority of the cases, you will do it with radio frequency. So you go with, a, with an electrode to that place, and you lesion a very small part of the brain. This is what, how, how this works, and this works fine. And here you see a picture from Irving Cooper from the mid 60s, who did a lot of cases with that. Mostly uh, it was tremor because it works so, so well in tremor. On the right side, on the side here, you see the patient held his hand and shows that the tremor has gone. It's not a video, but uh, we expect that he made a photo when the tremor was gone. And this was a classical therapy, which worked fine. But at that time also, we knew already, not we, but our ancestors knew that this was, that there were limits. Because with an ablative procedure, you have always the issue that it is an irreversible treatment. So there's no way back. It's not adaptable. So during the surgery, when you make such a lesion, you must make sure that you do it right, not too much, not too few. It's very important. And you can only do it on one side at a time. It's not possible to do bilateral uh, uh, treatments because then when you have the patients this way, it will end up this way. So you have at least wait for 18 months between uh, two sessions. And it's a wake surgery. Later you will hear why I say it's a wake surgery because we do it in general anesthesia when we go for deep brain stimulation. But there was another reason why there was a, uh, how to say, there were less uh, surgical treatments done because uh, in mid 60s, they started with a better medication for Parkinson's disease. So levodopa was introduced. And so uh, in fact, uh, stereotactic and functional neurosurgery for, for uh, movement disorders started in the 40s and there was a decline uh, early 70s until, that. This was in 86 when two scientists from France, so Alim Benabit and Pierre Polak, had the following idea. I mentioned that it's not possible to do the surgery on both sides. So when you have a patient with that, you can make him this way, but nothing more. And this is frustrating because the patients want to be tremor free. And then they had the great idea to say, okay, we put an electrode on the other side, because if we are not able to do a lesion, because we can't do it at the time, otherwise we risk side effects, why don't you put an electrode in it? And this is what they did. And they put an electrode and they used deep brain stimulation, which was known already at that time, but only for pain, but not for movement disorders. And they made the following. You see here the picture. They put an electrode on both sides. At the beginning, they put it only on one side. And on the other side, they made a lesion. This was the publication that you see here on the left side. This was from 87. But it was so amazingly good that they say, why don't we do it at the same time, two electrodes, and skip the lesion? And this is what they did. And this is a classical scheme from deep brain stimulation. You have the thalamus here, and you have on both sides, you have the electrode, and the electrode is fixated at the level of the bone and goes behind the ear, down, and here, and the pectoral region, the same place where you typically put a, a pacemaker. And the whole system is completely implanted, so the skin is above, no, no uh, side, not, nothing outside, and uh, you, you work with that remotely using uh, telemetry. You have a programmer, and you can uh, adjust the energy that you are giving. So you adjust the therapy. You can decrease it if you have side effects, or you can increase it when you have uh, symptoms. If, if you want to improve the therapy, you can uh, increase the uh, stimulation voltage or recently the current. The new systems are current based. So again, the picture and I think it's so amazing to show you that on the right side, you see a video from a patient where the stimulation is off. And this is to show you what happens when you uh, switch the stimulation on. 
look at that, it's immediately you cut the tremor. But you do not heal the patient. You simply cut the symptom. You take away the symptom. It's like glasses. You put the glasses and immediately the vision is clear. Take it off, the vision is blurry. And this is very much the same. So this is what we are doing. We are interrupting the circuit between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. So this loop, this is what we are doing. We can do it with the lesion, but we can do it also with the stimulation. This is what we did with the stimulation. Here you can really see where you are switching back and forth and you see that the tremor is gone. Now the, uh, the picture is frozen, but uh, this, this way, how you treat these patients. And uh, if the tremor is not, uh, sufficiently depressed, so you have to increase the stimulation. If the patients have side effects, this can be speech problems or, or uh, paresthesia, you decrease it. So you can really adapt the therapy to the patient's needs. So I think this is the standard therapy today. And I, I don't know if it is more than 150,000 patients operated uh, worldwide, so I stopped counting, but there are many patients operated worldwide and, and this works really fine. Uh, so when we started this uh, in the 90s, we always thought this is an experimental therapy, but this is not an experimental therapy. This is standard, this is a safe implantation procedure, and it is in our country, it is available standard. Uh, in other countries, it, it's not so available because it's a matter of price. These uh, implants are quite expensive. And also the equipment that you need for doing uh, such surgery is also expensive. So maybe available is not always the case, but it should be. And this is what I was so happy that we were able to uh, implement this at uh, the Saudi German hospital in us here that we have this fantastic cooperation also with Riyadh that we really want to offer this to these poor patients. And we have seen over the years a lot of changes. We have seen uh, an increase in the indications. I will come back to that. We have seen a shift from the targets. We have seen an improvement of the implantation tools we have seen a great jump forward for the implantable material, and we have learned a lot uh, for patient selection. So I think we, uh, these were busy uh, decentness. And the indications uh, for movement disorders, because today I'm talking about movement disorders, is of course Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is the most frequent uh, disease. It's it's so frequent and we know so much about it, Parkinson's disease and it's so clear and, and we can anticipate what happens when we stimulate these patients. But all kinds of tremor work equally well. So this can be essential tremor, cerebellar, rubral, all these kinds of tremor work and it works well in dystonia. It works well in every kind of dystonia, generalized, segmental, cervical, all these things work fine. But again, I think you only do it when you have tried all the others, the conservative treatment. It's not a de de primo therapy, but it's also used in psychiatry. Psychiatrists are amazed about this as well. Uh, it works very well in obsessive compulsive disorder. It's a may, again, a, a matter of secretary. There is, some part of the brain that is really hyperactive. And this is what you are cutting in obsessive compulsive disorder. Very well, it works also in Gilles Tourette syndrome. And it was a bit deceiving that it did not work so nicely in depression. There were papers uh, at 2005, there was a nice paper in synapse uh, and no, neuron, in neuron. And uh, they thought that this would be a wonderful therapy, but it does not work so well in depression. The reason is why uh, depression is a very multifactorial thing and uh, is not, it, I don't think that is really a good idea to stimulate these patients. Uh, and it's coming from pain. Mentioned already, the origins, the origins of uh, deep brain simulations are in pain. And you can treat, in fact, all kind of severe pain conditions, not, not some, some pain, no, no, severe pain conditions. Uh, this can be thalamic syndrome, root avulsion, zoster, post-herpetic zoster, neuralgia, and the plexus lesion, 
this works fine. Unfortunately, it's not so common. There are other treatments for pain that are probably preferable, but there's not the, the, the knowledge for this. Uh, but if you look at this, this is a, a slide from uh, 2019. These are the uh, studies, worldwide studies registered for deep brain stimulation. This is done by clinicaltrials.gov. You can have a look at that. And uh, this is from the National Institute of Health, the United States. And this should give you a bit of an idea where the focus is on. And you see the, the, the blue part here, 32%, this is Parkinson's disease, because this is the most uh, common uh, movement disorders and it works best there. And also dystonia on the same, uh, mood disorders is smaller. And you see here some psychiatric indications. And what I feel is always a bit disappointing is that pain is not represented that much. Uh, it's a pity because it works really fine. Again, we are not talking about uh, light uh, pain conditions. We are talking about very severe pain conditions, uh, thalamic syndrome, root avulsions, people who really suffer. This is not nothing against a head edge or something like this. And what is interesting as well is that we have only very few targets for doing so. So uh, what is an ideal target? The target is where you reach uh, the brain on the place where you can specifically reduce or shut down one path without major side effects. And here you see the targets, what we are using. Uh, Again, the picture on the left side, the MRI, again, to show you where we are. And on the right side, this is on the Schaltenband Atlas. There's a fantastic book where you can see the different uh, nuclei. Here you see the VIM nucleus again. This is the one I mentioned already at the beginning of my talk, the VIM, which is the classical target for tremor ventral intermediate thalamic nucleus, the blue one here that I outlined here, a blue way. And here you see the thalamus, this is the thalamus. Here you see the capsula interna, so the dark gray is the pyramidal tract, the capsula interna. And you are very close to the capsula interna. So it's very important that you can adapt the electrical field in a way that you do not stimulate the capsula interna, because when you stimulate the capsula interna, we will have crisp hand crisps or speech problems and so. So it's very important to really place the electrode in the middle of the ventral intermediate nucleus. But there are other and other uh, targets there. The most common target is the subthalamic nucleus here in orange. This is very close to the VIM. So we are in a very narrow place there. And there are lots of connections between two and the STN, so the subthalamic nucleus, you're using it for treating tremor. You can treat tremor with it. You can also treat rigidity and echinacea. So it's in, uh, uh, in fact, it's the most, uh, is the best treat, uh, the best uh, target for treating all these symptoms. And you have another target, which is the globus pallidus interno. So internus, this is on the other side of the capsula interna. It's much larger. This uh, GPI target is much larger than the outline here in green. But I took this picture in order to show you the relationship of these three targets. Uh, this is only within a 10 millimeters space. So it's a, a, a treatment that must be very, very accurate. And this is the reason why you need so uh, specific equipment for doing so. So GPI is very similar. To STN, you can treat tremor, rigidity, akinesia. All these things can be treated by this. But you have also, uh, with the GPI, a fantastic target for treating dystonia. And this is amazing. i tell you something. This is a cut, a horizontal cut through uh, the thalamus. This is, we saw, first we saw uh, frontal cuts. This is a horizontal one. Again, the globus pallidus internus. This is, looks like a banana. I always say, it, it's a banana in the MR. You see something, a structure that uh, remembers very much a banana. And what is interesting on the GPI is that when you go to the posterior part of the GPI, you can treat symptoms like dystonia 
or dyskinesias in Parkinson's disease, you have this motor overactivity. But when you go on the anterior part, which is more anterior and more medial, so about 11 millimeter or 12 millimeter lateral to the midline, you go to the limbic part of the brain. So you treat, for instance, Tourette syndrome there. So this is more psychiatric. And so you have a functiotopic uh, structure of the GPI as well. Posterior lateral, you have the motor part, and enter your medial, you have the limbic part. So think about that when you go for treating either dystonia or Parkinson's disease, or when you go for a psychiatric indication like is the uh, Gilles de la Tourette syndrome. And when you do that, you have to be, I mentioned it several times already, you must be very precise. You cannot do that freehand. It's not possible. You need a stereotactic equipment. On the left side is a German uh, branded system that was developed in the 50s as the Richard Mundinger system. This is the system that I'm using primarily. This is also the system that we have on the different places in Saudi Arabia and a Saudi German hospital. We have it in Jeddah. We have it in, in Arsir. And in the middle, this is the Lex Health system, very good system as well. Many of you know that probably because it's the most known. It is a very common system, the Lex Health system, developed in Scandinavia by uh, Lars Lex Health. And on the right side, you have a French system, which was developed by uh, Jean Talarach in, in Paris. It was never really commercialized. And this is only for historical reasons that I'm showing you that, because there is a lot of mathematics in the right one in the Talera system is, is a genius system, and uh, but this is no longer available, maybe because it's too complicated. Uh, when we started in 90, when we did the first implantation, I had uh, uh, Alim Benabit with me in Vienna. And uh, on the right side, you see the, the drawing that he made in my OR. Uh, this was purely based on ventriculography. We injected contrast medium into ventricles and we took the, uh, the landmarks, which are the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure. And we uh, calculated our target on this, but we had also to go back to the atlas in order to know where we are. So we had always the two things. One was the ventriculography and the other is the uh, atlas. But this is not what we are longer doing. This is a picture from that. No, it's recently, but uh, this is not what we are uh, anymore doing. What we are doing today is we have fantastic pictures in MRI. We see the target. Three Tesla imaging is amazing. Uh, you see the target and you see here the uh, subthalamic nucleus. This is not a good picture that I took for displaying it to you, but this is always the same. These are randomly taken pictures, and you always see in these pictures the subthalamic nucleus here in, in, uh, in yellow, and you see the uh, substanza nigra in, in uh, black, and you see the red nucleus, which are not targets. The only target here is the subthalamic nucleus. This is what we are seeing. Unfortunately, uh, the MRI is, gives fantastic pictures, very detailed pictures, but there is some distortion in it. And when you only rely on the MRI pictures, you will miss the target, you will not hit the target. So this is the reason why you have to mix the pictures, you fuse it. You take the MRI to see uh, the target, to see it, to understand well uh, the neighbors, but you take the CT, which is much more blurry, but very precise in matters of uh, geometric accuracy, and you fuse the pictures. Here it is. The, the process of fusing, you have two set of data, MRI and CT, and the computer makes the rest. It's, it's really easy to do that. And then you have the, uh, the pictures from MRI that you can use to define the target. And you have the CT pictures that you use for the geometry that you need, because otherwise you will be lost in the brain. You need a very precise and accurate uh, a description of your target, which is described with the coordinates X, Y, and Z. And when you have the coordinates, you go back to your stereotactic system and you hit the target. Here you see again, uh, this is the targeting tools that we're using. Here you see the banana, by the way, 
This is the banana. It's not that well visible, but this is an implantation uh, inside the GPI. This is a patient with dystonia because uh, GPI is the classical target for dystonia. And here again, <clears throat> you see an image fusion. <clears throat> the upper part, it is uh, from CT and the lower part <clears throat> is from MRI. Sorry for my... Yeah, and you can, of course, if you are curious and if you are interested, and when you have the time, I must say, uh, you can also uh, make microelectrode recording. You go with a special needle inside your targets and you listen to the electrical signal that these uh, targets are producing. It's a very nice noise. So the SDN, for instance, has a fantastic noise that you immediately recognize. Uh, I feel personally that this is nice. We did it for many years. Clinically, it's not really relevant because we rely more on anatomy. But for scientific reasons, I think that still uh, microelectric recording is a fantastic thing. And there are many centers who rely very much on this. They rely less on anatomy, but I think this is a bit like, like you cook. You like more fish or my food, my more meat and so, but I think, uh, we prefer to do it perfectly on an anatomical base. Here's a, a picture from my OR. You see, we do not ask the patients if the electrode is in the right spot. We simply do it in general anesthesia and we fully rely on uh, the anatomy. When I started with that, I was a bit how to say, criticized by my colleagues, because I've been doing this for 15 years in local anesthesia, so on an awake patient. And in 2005, I decided to go for anesthesia. And I was so excited about this because it's so much easier for the patients when they sleep and when they get awake and they have the system implanted. But I was criticized at that time. Many people criticized me. And I was very happy when in 2012, I had this uh, publication, I saw these publications uh, from the United Kingdom where they had 82 patients implanted all in general anesthesia in one center. And they were able to show that there is no inferiority between the surgery in general anesthesia and the awake surgery, no inferiority. This is what we need. We don't need to be better because I think the system works. And if we go for general anesthesia, it's enough if we are not inferior. But I have more to show. In 2015, we published the results of a, a, a study that we did where I was the PI from this study with 40 patients where by chance, it was by chance, 20 had been operated in general anesthesia and 20 had been operated in local anesthesia. So as a, a, a awake surgery in six centers. And again, we were able to compare this because we had all the raw data. This was a huge study. And we had all the raw data and we were able to show that there's no inferiority. Again, there's enough, we don't need more. And I think this is one other advantage for deep brain stimulation that you can do it in general anesthesia, which is not the case when you go for lesional. For lesional, you always need the patient awake. You need to interact with the patient because you want to see when the tremor is gone and you don't have, don't want to have a patient who has later maybe a speech, a speech problem also. So, when we go for lesional, it's always weak. When you go for deep brain stimulation, at least in my center, centers, I must say, uh, it's always in general anesthesia. And I'm not alone. It's only some examples. There are many centers uh, in the middle. Uh, in the meantime, that are doing this. I see this is an old picture. I have a much more recent one with much more logos on it. So I think it's useful to go for anatomical placement of these electrodes. And you see that also the industry has seen that and the industry is offering a lot of tools that you can use. You can use Medtronic OR, the Brain Lab Arrow and so on. There are so many uh, systems outside that can be outside there that can be used for, for doing this type of surgery. But not only for the implantation procedure, 
uh, the industry has become awake, but also for the implantable material. We have been using the implantable materials uh, on an off-label base from spinal cord stimulation for many, many years. But then suddenly, this is what we were using, the classical implant. This was on the left side. This was a spinal cord stimulator. And we had to use it because there's nothing uh, was available. But then suddenly more and more uh, manufacturers saw this unique chance and there was a big market coming, Medtronic. There was also Abbott. They have an, a very uh, crazy thing with an iOS base. So this is not from Apple. So it's only the interfaces coming from Apple. Very easy to use for the doctor, very easy to use uh, for the patients. This is iOS based system. Again, the same. This is the one that we were using in uh, in uh, Asir. But there are also other systems. There's an, an, a pacemaker company, Boston Scientific. They have also a very interesting uh, system on the market. So I think there's a lot of competition there. And I think we are profiting from this because the more competition there is, the better the products finally will be. And what is also a very interesting development in this, typically these uh, electrodes, they have ring, they are ring configuration. This is a ring and you stimulate at what you're doing is a bubble. But the more recent systems have segmented electrodes. These segmented electrodes give you the possibility to, to uh, direct the electrical current to different, uh, different uh, directions. I think this, is, this should show you that. This is a, a, a segmented uh, configuration, you see that you are able to uh, direct the electrical current <clears throat> to other regions. So imagine I showed you the uh, pyramidal tract, so the capsular interna, and you see you have a side effect coming from the uh, pyramidal tract. So you take away the electrical field, the electrical current, and you make an electrical field that is much more adapted for these patients. Here again, you see a, a, a fluoroscopic picture from these electrodes. And we have had so many new technologies. I do not want to bother you with that, but we have constant current. We have independent multi-source uh, systems. We can shape the electrical field recently, or not even recently, but we have also rechargeable systems. They are very small the systems because they do not have to carry around the battery for years. So they are small and they are very ergonomic as well because you have the ergonomy of iOS and the, the systems that the patients are getting to interact with, the, with their implant are becoming more and more uh, ergonomic. And here you see a nice picture. What we are able to do, we can take the MRI data, we can take the stimulation data, we can take the CT data and we implement them to a big picture where we have a three-dimensional view of what we are doing and we can uh, better understand what we are doing because there are so many possibilities that you have with the system. It's time consuming. It's really time consuming at the beginning when you get accustomed to it, when you get trained and so when you have uh, the experience, you know how to organize it, but still it's time consuming at the beginning. Later, when the electrode is finally placed, I anticipate also a question that will probably come from the audience later. How long does that last? Uh, is there a dissipation of the therapy after a while? No, it's no dissipation of that. We do not cure the patient. We do not cure him. We, we do not cure the disease. Uh, so there will be a progression of this disease, but there will not be a fading of the therapy efficiency. So a patient who has been tremor-free for five years, he will also be tremor-free in another five years. I think this is very important. This is anticipation of a question that always comes. And now the way to DBS. This is another question. I assume that there are many neurologists here. You will probably ask how, what, how can it? Uh, what is the appropriate candidate for STN DBS. Uh, when you go for Parkinson's disease, I say that we'll talk about Parkinson's disease. The title is about movement disorders, but the majority of my slides of my foils is about Parkinson's disease. It's very important. It must be an idiopathic Parkinson's disease. It cannot be something like Parkinson's. It doesn't work. The patient must have a good response to levodopa. 
or to epomorphin. Because this is a test you make. If the patient reacts well to levodopa and epomorphin, you know this patient will uh, react well to deep brain stimulation. Very important. If he will not after, you have to question yourself and say, hey, might it be that the electrode is not in the right spot? Good response to levodopa is essential. And of course, a good candidate for this is a pay because he will ask when he is good responding to levodopa, why do I operate him? Yes, I can tell you. Because these patients often uh, suffer from fluctuations, so they have good response, but only for a few minutes, and then they drop. And they become dyskinetic. Though I think this is the extreme uh, problem that these patients have, reacting well, but fluctuating, and uh, they have dyskinesias. This is the classical patient that we operate, and these are the patients who most take out of the therapy. And then, of course, I mentioned it initially already, the refractory tremor. Tremor is hard to treat with medical treatment. And if this is refractory tremor, these patients are good candidates for surgery. What are the features of idiopathic Parkinson's disease? Classical features, slowly progressing. History should be longer than five years, because otherwise you risk into come into a gray zone where you do not know if this patient might uh, have some multi-system atrophy. Typically, Parkinson's disease has an asymmetric onset. There should not be early or prominent dysautonomia, so not, nothing with that. So it must be simply motor disease and of course should not be major or prominent cognitive uh, dysfunction. Normal eye movements, of course, all these things that might lead us to other uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So make sure that this is a good and classical Parkinson's disease, and then you have a good uh, chance to make this patient happy. And of course, there are many reasons not to operate. Uh, I will not mention them all now. Uh, yes, when to operate? Uh, when I started with that in 90, I thought we will operate the patients that really failed with all. And then we ended up patient, operating patients that had the disease already for more than 15 years. This is too late. We learned from this study, which was called the early STEM study, I must say that I was against that. I did not participate. I said, no, no, I, will, I don't like that. I don't like that. When they started, because the early STEM study said we will operate the patient not at the very end, but we will operate the patient at the moment where they start experiencing side effects, can be fluctuations or dyskinesias. This is where the mo at the beginning, every Parkinson patient is reacting well to uh, levodopa. Okay, fine. Five years after, there is a portion of the patient coming and they have side effects fluctuations or dyskinesias. And this is, I think, we know it from the study, this is the moment where you should really uh, think about surgery because you can keep uh, the patient in his working life. You can avoid problems in his social surroundings, in his family. And I think there is an ideal moment where the patient should be operated, if ever. So. We do not force the patient to be operated. But if there is an ideal moment, I think this would be when the patient is experiencing side effects uh, from the medication. And the side effects are typically the dyskinesias and the fluctuations. This is the moment where you should really think about the surgery. I think I could go on for a long time for talking about this, but I will make some publication for uh, uh, advertisement for me because my good friend and neurologist, uh, Dieter Foltz and I, we will talk about this issue uh, on this webcast. Uh, have a look there. Would be happy to invite some of you to join out there for talking about the long and uneasy journey of Parkinson's disease. I said a lot now about deep brain stimulation. I have to come back. It's already late. Uh, even two hours later in Saudi Arabia than it is here. And so is there still a place for ablative 
stereotactic surgery? I think yes. I think we have the issue of the price of the devices. We have the issue that these patients are blocked forever with an implant. We have to consider this and we should not lose the ability to offer both options to the patients. And for me, one very good option to go for lesional therapy is the patient, because it's easy. You can, you see this picture here with a small dot in the thalamus that we made on these patients, a thalamotomy in this patient. And this is a patient with a unilateral tremor. And when you have a patient with a unilateral tremor, and you know that when you make a lesion there, and you can use all what we learned over the years now from deep brain simulation simply to make the lesion, you should do it. This is what I'm always discussing with my neuro neurological friends because they are more interested in doing deep brain simulation because they feel more safe with that. But I think there is a place to do a lesion. Would like to show you this patient. Preoperative. Must say this patient had a in fact, a cerebellar tremor based on a multiple sclerosis. This patient has multiple sclerosis, but luckily he had only one tremor uh, on one side, a tremor on one side. Here you see him writing, which is a, a major problem. I will skip that because we are already late. And I'll show you the status after a VIM thalamotomy. And this is not a frozen picture. This is my patients who stopped checking. And I think this is a classical example for me where I would not advise going for a deep brain stimulation. This is where uh, a lesion is fantastic. And I would advise the patient that he was happy about this. Again, this, the, the writing is good, improved. I would skip that because otherwise another patient, whoopla, forget to shut, switch off the sound. A patient with essential tremor. Okay, and this is the same patient after. Not yet, now. Tremor free. I think this is, these are patients that I would really uh, encourage to, uh, to go for uh, lesional therapy. I think we should have both both options and offer always the best for our patients. I think this is like always in, in neurosurgery, we have to have the whole scope and we choose the best. Okay, now I'm curious to hear your questions. Thank you, Professor Alish. Really, this, thanks. Uh, elegant presentation. I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, really enjoyed it. You make things look easy and uh, very favorable for everyone who are interested in the field of uh, function neurosurgery. Uh, I will leave the floor for my panelists, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Sabri from Riyadh and Dr. Ayman Hafiz from uh, Asir to contribute by comments or if they have any questions. Mm -hmm. And me myself have some questions. I'll keep it for the end. Thank you. I'm really very <laughs> jealous, but let me say one word. I'm yeah. very jealous that you have 551 participants now because we do the same with <coughs> go to gdmed.com. Uh, we do not have yes. that many. <laughs> I have a lot of Congratulations fans. to Mr. Shobitz. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, actually, well, those are my fans. Huh? That is your fans. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, very, very fantastic. Uh, really, even if this number is uh, uh, high, but I think uh, the one Blim himself not announced enough for a very fantastic lecture that all the neurologists need it. We have uh, really, we, uh, yani, for uh, most of our opinion is that we are still very back in um, reaching the proper treatment of such miserable patients. Uh, those patients with involuntary movement and disorders are usually suffer so much up to a suicidal ideation and depression and more and more um, effects social and at work. Um, because the mental function of them is very vivid, but at the same time, they are handicapped in a way, even 
they don't have to isolate, have to. So to have a approach for them, uh, it is very nice. I'm not taking too much on this, but I have, uh, if there is any chance also in Parkinson for some trial to stimulate as substantia nigra no, versus no. globus no. pallidus? No, uh, substantia nigra is, is not a good uh, target. Uh, it becomes more too too complex now if I uh, uh, tell you that. I think that uh, the substantia nigra has a close relationship to the uh, pedunculopontine nucleus. And when you stimulate the uh, substantia nigra, you may induce an effect on the pedunculopontine nucleus, and this may trigger the gate, for instance. But this yeah. is a very nice idea, but the reality is different. So the uh, the results of these studies have been relatively mm. disappointing. Right. This is nothing that I would display right. here. I have the picture, but I took it out. I will not talk about uh, things that, that I would not advocate for. Okay. Uh, my second question is, do we have a perfect animal models for these cases? Yeah, I think so, yes. Yes, I think, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not mine. It's not what I like, but I know that uh, uh, Benabiti made a lot of uh, uh, monkey experiments, and also uh -huh. uh, Malon de Long, who who who, who drawed his uh, interesting scheme how this works. All this was done on a monkey. Uh, and with, monkeys. With with, uh, the, with time of using the stimulation, is there is any fading down and recurrence of this tremor with time? No, 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 this is what I said. Uh, the, if the electrode is on the right spot, the effect is permanent. If the, uh, if it will not, because the electrode is anchored in a way that nothing can, can happen. So you will, if you pull it out, you, you destroy yeah. it, but you will never make it loose. And if you are on the right spot, you have always the same effect. It's very, very important. This is what we were a bit, how to say, worried about when we started, because we didn't know how long it will last. But there are plenty of studies out there that show that this works forever. But you will have other symptoms. You know, as a neurologist, there will be other symptoms. Uh, gait problems, balance, instability, axial problems, they come. You will see that. You cannot treat it because we only treat tremor, rigidity, and akinesia. Right. I do have other questions, but I leave the floor for my colleague, Dr. Ayman, and for the audience, then I come right back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the talk. Um, you, you have talked a lot about the indications, about the surgical technique, but um, there, there is a point that I think that we miss when we deal with our patients. We have, from our experience here in Asir, what do you think the patient part after we do the implant, the selection and the implantation, what is the, the role of the patient after the implantation? Is it just go back to normal life? Yes. Like to elaborate on yes, this? yes, I think so. I think so, yes. I think for the patient, this is a normal life after. Uh, according to rules that we prescribe, I think it's very important that these patients go to physiotherapy. You know that we have a, an issue uh, in, in, in your center that the patient was refusing uh, physiotherapy. But I think this is, we, we, we have to be a team. It's very important that the patient understands that this is necessary because we take away the brake, but he has to drive again. I think this is uh, something that the patients have to relearn after. We do not uh, steer them. We do not remotely control them. We simply reduce this hyperactivity inside the brain on certain paths, uh, and the patient has to do the rest. This is uh, physiotherapy. This is ergotherapy. It's very important. And training, of course, any kind of training. So I, I think one of the indications or one of the decision uh, points for the surgery is the patient enthusiasm, understanding and enthusiasm of what is going to happen after surgery. It is not just put the implant, I'm back to normal, I will not do anything. This, I don't think this works well. Yeah, the expectation must be correct. I think this is a problem that you have really, if, if the patient says, well, I feel bad, see bad, life isn't, isn't funny anymore, and so don't touch him. Because I think you need very clear 
symptoms and you have to discuss that with the family and you have to consider the age of the patient and say okay this patient is already in his 70s so okay he will not be like 50 after i think this is very important the the uh, the pre-operative discussion with the patient and to really define the goals what you are doing with them and that I, other um, why you fail don't yeah. touch it then. yes it's not magic. Hear. This is not magic. This is a, a very. This is like my glasses. Huh? Uh, when I put them, it's okay. When I put them off, it's blurry. And this is very much the same. And I need correct glasses. And because putting only glasses on my nose is not enough. I need correct glasses. This is like correctly placed electrodes. Um, one last question in uh, in the evolving world of the post-COVID and uh, limited or limitation in the travel capacities. Um, would you like to enlighten us about the um, possibility of remote uh, programming and remote adjustment of the implantable, uh, of the implant itself, rather than physical contact with the patient? I, Any debates about this? I don't see the, the, the pipeline from the companies, but I'm very sure that they are full with all these uh, remote equipment and this would be already in the market without COVID now because they are not able to to promote it but I'm sure that in one year from now this will be maybe not standard but this will be available. So I think the future is for remote, just implantation and then remote adjustment and uh, the... This is what we're doing already we too. We do a teleconsultation. We, 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 this is what we had to learn that during uh, the pandemic now, and I'm very happy and I hope so much that we will not lose that after because there are also nice parts that we can take. Well, actually, well, only we are, catastrophe. What we are doing now is I get the patient to tell me what to do and I do it. So I, I meant to just. <laughs> no, just this is one, one, one way of the remote control, yes. yes. <laughs> No, I so I would to... take the, the, the question, Dr. Ayman, about uh, the uh, <clears throat> remote assistance for these kinds of patients and take it, is it an indication for ablative procedure, uh, the lack of uh, uh, or the easy access to the medical facilities like patients coming from abroad, patients uh, living in uh, rural areas, is it an indication to do ablative surgery rather than uh, putting a DBS? Yeah, and the so. extension to my question is the age limit for, for example, for young patients or 30s or 40s. Uh, do you think the ablative procedure for single sided tremors will be good or you put DBS because expectation of progression of disease by age? If you want to have my personal uh, answer, uh, I like doing lesions because it's so service free. You, you go to one side, you make away the tremor, everybody's happy after. And I think this is a, a, a good way to, to keep it simple, to keep it uh, cheap, uh, and to keep away the uh, lifelong replacements, which is necessary, even if you, if you recharge. But this is not always possible. And many patients do not want to have it. And then it's risky, of course, because if the patient prefers to have a deep brain stimulation, don't touch him with a lesion. I think uh, maybe 5% of the pay or 10% of the patients uh, are good candidates for lesions, but if the patient is a good candidate, I really like to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is concerning the rural uh, environment of the patients. I think, yes, if you have really the issue of the following the patient up, because forget about remote programming when the patient is somewhere in wherever, where you can reach him, he will not have uh, 5G to, to program. Uh, so, in such a case, I would I think it's preferable to go for lesion. Uh, Prof. Alish, I have <clears throat> seen sometimes that you, uh, I know there are many techniques for insertion for the electrodes, and sometimes it's one millimeter uh, modification, and I some of the electrodes have uh, like a bolt with many frustrations that you can try uh, uh, and. Do you think the robotic surgery has a role in the implant uh, insertion? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Uh, because 
a robotic is good when you have repetitive movements, always the same. Huh? When you do, say, for epilepsy uh, diagnostic or so, you need to, to put, say, 10 electrodes, always the same, boom, 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 then you take the robots because this is easy. But when you have only one electrode to place, even if it's bilateral, you have two procedures to follow and you will not do it with the robot. If you have the robot, you will use it, of course. But it would, in my opinion, it would not be a, a reason to purchase a robot. And in my opinion, there's no superiority from the robot. If you have one, you can use it, but I would not uh, stress that out. So if no one have questions, I have lost a question from my side. Do you think the uh, MRI brain stimulation or uh, MRI guided uh, ablative techniques, uh, do you think they will be replacing the regular radio frequency techniques or still it's not applicable? I think the MRI uh, procedures have the problem that they block uh, the MRI. Are ah, you talking about uh, ultrasound? Yeah. Yeah, we are very early with that. I, I think it's, it's uh, we have to see, uh, it's an interesting technique Definitely, uh, I think this can replace the radio frequency, but the question is we have still to wait for the uh, long-term results. Mm -hmm. And it's relatively expensive, it's relatively time consuming because you have to block the MRI for a long time because this takes also four hours, but I'm very in favor of this as well. So, uh, but a, a, a well done thalamotomy with a uh, radio frequency is, is a, a nice thing. We would see. And for uh, the navigation, you like the frameless navigation or no, frame-based navigation? <clears throat> We're talking about this. A, we, we, yeah, of course, only only frame-based. <clears throat> because we are talking about an a, a, uh, accuracy from one millimeter, you will not achieve that with the navigation. Definitely not. And it's, it's so frustrating when you uh, purchase a very expensive system. Maybe the patient has to purchase it. And uh, you have a situation where you have a result because you get a result, but for the price of a high current drainage or for side effects, or and this, is, this is the most critical thing, for a fading, because you have an effect, the patient comes back the day after and he says, no, I'm shaking your head. You adjust again, patient goes home without tremor, comes back the next day. You, you can be sure that you're out of focus because you have an effect in the moment where you do it, but after the patient has a recurrency. And this is so frustrating. It's blocking your time when you have to program all the time the patient, because typically this is something that is done after three weeks. After three weeks, you should have been able to find the, uh, the optimal setting for these patients, and that's it. So don't go for navigation. I, I'm not really uh, happy with this idea. Okay. Uh, so, any uh, idea? Uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, this question was coming to Dr. Mahmoud Sabri, our uh, neurologist. Uh, from your uh, feedback as uh, the, the primary physician who sees the patients with uh, movement disorders, namely Parkinson's disease, when you advise them for surgery, when you think your patient is in need for surgery, a time of diagnosis or a time <laughs> follow-up or what? I when think exactly that you feel you like to feel, uh, to refer to neurosurgery service. Right, right. The answer uh, was included in uh, talk of Dr. Dr. Alish. Let, let, me, let me repeat it again. I think that there are situations where you can anticipate that this will not improve because when a patient has a severe tremor, uh, you yeah. can try medication, but uh, you will probably fail. Then you have to tell the patient, I can, I can fix that for you. And also tell him he must be sincere. This is the beginning of Parkinson's disease. And after a while, this might also fade away from itself. So this is not, a, not for life. But if the patient is really, if I would do my presentation here shaking, I, I would have a problem. Yeah. So I think then you say, okay, I take you away that symptom and we wait how the uh, disease will evaluate. This is at the very early beginning. Uh, for the other patients that have uh, all three symptoms, so the trias, akinesia, rigidity, and tremor, uh, typically you 
can advise them already in an early stage, but today everybody's reading internet and so everybody's knowing everything at the beginning. But uh, typically you go uh, for surgery when the patient has side effects from medication. Uh, side effects means they react well, but they have situations where they fluctuate. They go from good to bad, uh, from, from good to bad to good to bad, and they start uh, doing this, this over movement, so dyskinesias, which is not a Parkinson sign, but this is a side effect from medication. This is the moment where the neurosurgeon should be on board and uh, should give his advice and, and the final decision surgery or not, is the one of the patient, the family, and of course, the neurologist. Yes. Uh, any ideas? Feedback to Mahmoud. Your I feedback. Have a, uh, uh, the thing, because we have to start the medication, as we say, and we can wait until five years or more when this fluctuation happen and the, the, the control of the, 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 the drug and this kinesia has started. This is the time to refer the patient um, for further evaluation. And this also my, my coming question for um, Professor Alish about what else, even electrophysiology, you, you tell even the uh, microelectrodes and the take um, any other investigation that you have to be or other protection. Suppose the patient having also epilepsy. If there is any matter or come to your mind, you have to have any precautions, any... No. Diversion. No. no. But Not this is an important point that you are bringing up there because uh, I think that especially when you do the surgery in general anesthesia, you don't care about epilepsy because even if the patient should have some focal or generalized uh, seizure, which happens, huh? should not, but can happen. Uh, when you're doing it in general anesthesia, this is only a transient thing. You say, okay, to the anesthetist, say, be careful, this was a, a seizure now. You have to give a river trill or volume, whatever he's giving, to cut it. When you do it in a awake patient, that's the end of the story for that day. You have to finish, you close, and uh, do, do the surgery, you postpone the surgery to another day. I think this is one of the major advantages of uh, surgery in general anesthesia, but luckily it's very rare that we have such a situation, very, very, very rare. I would say I experienced this in my career maybe five times. It's not really an issue. Um, one, one I, last question. I think there are so many questions from the, from the panel, huh? Yeah, so. <laughs> it's an interesting talk. But, but um, now let's go to pain management, not, not for the Parkinson thing. Um, for patients with CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome, would you go, severe, the severe, really severe pain, would you go for uh, DBS first or would you, you, would you go for sympathectomy first? Sympathectomy, of course, yes. Yes. Or, or then dorsal root ganglion stimulation, which is not my topic today, but which is very uh, effective therapy uh, for treating these patients with CRPS. I have one question from our attendees, Dr. Mustafa Abdurrahman. Uh, he is asking, he thanking you for your uh, nice presentation, and he is okay. asking on his words, any role of surgery for advances cases of Parkinson's disease? I think this is already surgery, what we are doing here. His question is, any role of surgery for advanced cases of Parkinson's disease? Yes, I think so. This is the cases that we operate. We operate cases with advanced Parkinson's disease. This is not a, a, a therapy for de novo cases. We, we, we do that when e either there is a very resist therapy resistant tremor, one thing, or when there are uh, severe side effects coming from the medication, uh, say fluctuations, good, bad, good, bad, or dyskinesias, then it is already advanced. We are, this is, or we say, late complications of Parkinson's disease. This is how we call that. So uh, my personal question also, we are working in an area where we see a lot of accidents in young age. So we start to see patients who develop extra pyramidal manifestations 
uh, especially those uh, surviving from uh, deep or uh, severe head injuries. So you think the secondary Parkinsonian for this kind of patients will be candidate for such? No, no, don't, don't, offer touch. Them. don't touch, no, no. I think the only thing that you can, that I saw repeatedly are patients with uh, cerebellar tremor with ataxia after severe uh, cranial injury. I think then a thalamotomy can be very helpful. Thalamotomy in a patient with which is these patients, yes. Yes, uh, these patients can profit from a thalamotomy because again here, it's a, a miscommunication between the cerebellum and the cerebrum and you cut this miscommunication uh, at the level of the thalamus and then it's better to have no communication instead of having a miscommunication. You cut it and communication decreases and the patient stops doing this one. This is the only uh, condition that comes to my mind when you uh, talk about uh, trauma. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, brainstorming together why this type of surgery is lagging, at least in, in our region. I think also in Europe, compared to, for example, thrombectomy and compared to epilepsy surgery, uh, although equivalent in um, uh, the cost or economic uh, requirements or financials. I think one of the reasons is we, we need more believers in the neurological community. You are one of them. And I have some here, but I have also non-believers. And I think we have to cope with this. We have to work with that. And we have to do things like I'm doing now. I'm counting the number. We have 544, an amazing number of people who listen to us. And maybe uh, I've been able to convince them that this is a complementary therapy. This is not the only therapy because these patients have to be uh, in neurological treatment for the rest of their years, but that we as neurosurgeons, we can add some input in order to, to improve the symptom. That's all. We do not catch for patients that we do not operate. We only catch for patients that uh, we, can, we can improve with surgical therapies. So, Dr. Ayman, you have any further comments? Well, it's not a comment, actually, but I would like um, just to inform or, an, or announce that we have uh, a setup here now in Asir that we can virtually uh, examine the patients with Professor Elish online, and we take the decision for surgical or not surgical, and the patients are scheduled for after the COVID after, um, whatever that means. Yeah. After we're the COVID <laughs> lockdown. So we, we actually are seeing patients now and uh, scheduling them for, uh, for the future, hopefully uh, when the travel becomes free again, when the world goes back to its normal, if it is ever going to. So we are not actually halted. We are uh, scheduling patients for, for the future. We just wanted everybody in neurology to know this. If you have patients, we are still available. Thank you. Okay, I think <laughs> we come to an end uh, to this uh, very, uh, one of the most interesting uh, presentations for the topic and for our great and uh, presenter, Professor Alish, who I really enjoyed the times we used to work together and hope soon we'll come back chances to See you again here in Egypt or in Saudi Arabia and uh, do some uh, more interesting cases together. Really, uh, Professor Elish is, um, he changed my scope about stereotaxy in general and how we manipulate and how we know the, the measurements, the mathematics behind the, 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 the different systems. I really enjoyed and I hope some more people will get the opportunity to get in contact with Dr. Alish and get uh, more and more from his uh, knowledge. Also, I have to thank my uh, big brother, Professor Mahmoud Sabri, 
for the support he is giving to the neurosurgery department on all the branches, <laughs> and again for his marvelous work uh, in the stroke units. Uh, Thank you, last but not least, my big brother, Professor Ayman. Uh, I can't comment, he is already my early mentor and I keep in contact with him and really uh, I enjoyed this uh, uh, presentation on the scientific and on the social and personal levels. Uh, be safe all uh, and have a new year for the coming new year. Wishing you a happier 2021. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it will be more and more uh, fruitful uh, times to come in the future. And we keep this kind of meetings. We learn it from the online activities that we can uh, do more and more to keep in touch and to keep our patient more safe and more uh, secure. Uh, by the name of Saudi German Hospital Group, I would like to uh, appreciate all the attendees also for coming and having uh, this uh, few minutes uh, with us, so wishing them all the best uh, and see you soon in another webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, it was a pleasure being with all of you. Thank you. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. Okay.